Okay, welcome back to asymptotics and perturbation methods. Uh, we have been talking about boundary layers for quite a while now. And um, mostly we've been focusing on the case where the boundary layers really occur at the boundary at either the left or right endpoint of some interval. But um, boundary layer theory can also apply when there are um, regions of rapid variation inside the interval. So we can have interior layers as well as boundary layers. And um, that's what we'll be discussing today and also in the next lecture. Um, today's topic is a special kind of internal layer called a corner layer for reasons that will become obvious once you see what it looks like. So let me dive in. All right. Okay, corner layers. Well, um, the treatment I'm giving here is taken from Mark Holmes's book, um, Introduction to Perturbation Methods. Uh, it follows that fairly closely, section 2.5 of his book. Um, but the first time I went through this with students many years ago, I was actually very heavily influenced by Bender and Orsog's treatment in their section 9.6 where they consider a more general problem than we're gonna be doing today. So I um, kind of wanna tell this story as a little bit of a narrative that is I'll, you know, I'll just be doing this one problem in some detail, but my own comprehension of it has evolved over the years. And so I wanna show you a few different ways of thinking about it. Um, I think it's sort of interesting. Okay, hope you do too. So anyway, here's the question. We'll just focus on this one example. Which is um, a little linear equation. Epsilon y double prime, as usual, plus x y prime. Uh, I think I want minus. Yeah, minus y equals zero. This is going to be on the interval from negative one to one. And um, let's have boundary conditions on it. So at negative one, y will equal one, whereas at positive one, let's say it equals two. And as usual, we're of course thinking in the, the limit as epsilon is going to zero from the positive side. Okay, so that's our, our question. And let's try to make sense of this critter. So you might notice it fits in the framework that we discussed last time for linear, second order linear um, boundary value problems. That is, you'll see that y is appearing linearly, you know, either its derivatives or y itself just to the first power. You don't have any functions of y like e to the y or any products like y squared or y times y prime or anything like that. Actually, in the next lecture, I will do a nonlinear boundary value problem. Those are much hairier and the theory is not super well developed actually. People are still doing research on nonlinear boundary value problems to this day when they have singular perturbations like we have here. Um, the linear case, what we're doing today is, is better understood. So anyway, so we've got this linear problem. Um, we, we mentioned last time that this coefficient multiplying the y prime term was really important in determining where the boundary layer would be. And if you'll recall, um, I mean, the notation we had used last time was, I'm, I would call that thing a of x. Your a of x is just x. And we wrote down a criterion for where the boundary layer is. You can see here, by the way, that I mean, last time we had to focus on the case where the A of X is of one sign, either strictly positive or strictly negative over the whole interval. 
in which case the boundary layer was that one endpoint or the other. But this X changes sign as we go through um, the origin, right? So this is changing sign on the interval at X equals zero. And what's that gonna do? Well, I mean, let's think about it this way. If we just focused on half of the interval, so like if we look on the subinterval from negative one to zero, um, let's say closed on the left, open on the right. On that subinterval, the coefficient a of x, well, since it's just x, it would be negative there. So the coefficient a of x of y prime is less than zero. Um, and that indicates, according to the criterion from last time, that um, we would expect the boundary layer to be on the right endpoint of that subinterval. I mean, I should probably put quotes on boundary layer because it's not a boundary point, but okay, just thinking in terms of that subinterval, you'd expect the boundary layer, the rapid variation to occur um, all right, that's a little messy. To occur over at x equals zero. Now, strictly speaking, x equals zero is not in that subinterval, but um, because I'm using a half open interval, but still, you might expect some rapid variation on the right side. And, and that's correct, that is what's going to happen. And then reasoning similarly on the other subinterval, um, going from zero to one, well, there, a of x would still equal to x, but it's now strictly positive over there. And so that would suggest um, some kind of boundary layer on the left endpoint, which again is x equals zero. So however we look at it, there's a suggestion here coming at it from both sides that something is gonna be happening at X equals zero that we have to take account of. Um, all right, so let's try to understand what's happening um, at X equals zero. Hence, we think there will be some kind of interior lay layer in the neighborhood of x equals zero. Um, well, by the way, just a little bit of jargon here. With this a of x changes sign, um, at x equals zero, we call that um, a turning point. So a turning point occurs there. You'll, we'll run into this concept of turning point later in the course when we talk about the so-called WKB method. But anyway, this is our, I guess our first encounter with, with uh, a turning point problem. Okay, so what I'm gonna do next is break the problem up into the usual inner and outer regions and try to solve in each part and match things together. And we'll see what's happening. And some of the interesting features just to anticipate a little. Um, I mean, I don't think keeping people in suspense is a great thing in math class. So I'm gonna foreshadow a little bit. We'll, we'll see something that we haven't seen before, which is that our dominant balance calculation uh, to find the thickness of the inner layer, it's gonna actually involve three terms. Usually our dominant balance has been between two terms and the third term is smaller. Here we're gonna actually see three terms all of the same order of magnitude. So that's a little bit of an unusual feature for us and it, it leads to some interesting phenomena. All right, but anyway, not thinking ahead that far yet. Um, let's see our equation. So 
there it is. We could do the naive thing and just sort of assume this term is small and that will be true in the outer region. So let me do that part first. Maybe I'll pause here though. Anyone wanna ask anything so far about the setup or anything else? Okay, so far so good. All right, so let's figure out what's happening in the outer region. Well, so there we neglect the term with the epsilon in it. And let's just do this at lowest order in, in the, we'll do a perturbation expansion for y. At lowest order, the lowest term would be y sub zero. So we would get x um, y sub zero prime minus y sub zero is zero. That's coming from the, just looking at these two terms and plugging in y sub zero. Okay, so there's our outer equation, first order ODE. And that's a pretty easy one to solve actually by separation of variables. That's just a first order equation and you can solve um, by separating variables. And actually you could also solve by inspection. It turns out anything that's a constant times X will work. Just plug that in and it works. You get CX minus CX. So that's nice. You get a, these straight line solutions that go through the origin. Um, though we have to determine C somehow. So how are we gonna determine C? Well, we have boundary conditions at, at the, both the right and left end. We think there's an inner layer near the origin. So it's appropriate to apply the boundary conditions at the endpoints at negative one and plus one to this. I mean, these are, this is the behavior in the outer region. So it, it is legit to say um, that we expect Y zero at one to be, let's see, what did I say? That's um, supposed to be two, whereas to lowest order Y zero at negative one is supposed to be positive one. So this is two. That tells us that we're getting, let me call it um, Y zero on the right side of the origin. So R for right will just be two X. And applying the boundary condition on the left side of the interval where we have Y zero of negative one is, is plus one it's gonna give us y zero on the left of x. Well, it's gonna to have to be, I mean, if you substitute in here, x equals negative one right there, and then you're supposed to get positive one, that tells you c is negative one. So this is gonna be negative x. Isn't this already a problem? Because you're supposing that you have one solution and then you actually don't get the solution that satisfies both, both boundary conditions? Well, so I'm saying in the outer region, um, this is Y zero is gonna be some constant times X, but the outer region here means everything away from the origin. So in fact, the picture looks like this. If I, let me draw my, I mean, I think you'll, you'll believe it after we draw a picture. Hope so. So here's the x-axis. Here's one, here's negative one. Um, on this, let me put down two and one. So over here, we're supposed to have a boundary condition where we go up to two. I haven't drawn it very well to scale. Um, over here, the boundary condition is that we're supposed to be there. And we're gonna try to keep away from whatever is happening near the origin, because that's something else going on. But what I'm saying is in the outer region over here, we're predicting something that's coming in with a slope of two towards the origin. And over here, we're coming in with a slope of negative one towards the origin. And then this is the inner region where we have to somehow make a transition between those two outer behaviors. So are you okay with it now, Maria? 
Yeah, so, so it's basically okay to have different behaviors in the outer region if the outer region is separated by the boundary layer? Yes, that's right. Exactly. Okay. Well put. Yep. Okay. Right. If the inner region separates the outer region into two disconnected components, then you can solve in each component separately. Yep. Good. So, you know, what's interesting, you can sort of see from this picture, given that we had 2x and negative x, I mean, these are on a collision course to hitting at the origin. So um, you can already, I mean, that's not gonna happen because once we get close enough to the origin, then the term we neglected will no longer be negligible. But at least what we can see so far is that the outer solution um, is continuous. I mean, if we extended it all the way into the origin, We haven't seen that before, right? Our, our outer, often what we had to do was um, put in a boundary layer to cause some matching between it. Like we had to accommodate some kind of what looked like a discontinuous jump. Here we don't have a discontinuous jump, but we do have a discontinuity in the derivative, apparently. Something sort of like an absolute value function seems to be happening near the origin. Um, so the outer solution appears to be continuous, but it does have a slope discontinuity. in that it's somehow jumping from negative one slope to positive two slope at x equals zero. So if we were just naively extending the outer solution into the origin, we'd have this discontinuity in there. But um, that's what's going on in the inner region that somehow we have to blend these two slopes in a smooth way together. So let's try to understand what's happening in the inner region. Okay, so we have some scale here. I mean, this is gonna be sort of like, we don't quite know yet what the thickness of this is, but um, last time we talked about trying to estimate thickness of boundary layers. And so this issue is gonna come up right here. We have some inner region of some thickness delta where the delta depends on our epsilon. And we expect that this will go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. And the picture certainly suggests that. So let us try to figure out the distinguished limit, the correct scaling for um, this delta in terms of epsilon. So at the moment, we don't know what it is. And let's just say big X is little x over delta with delta to be determined, where we're gonna figure that if we've chosen big delta, or if we've chosen delta correctly, big X should be order one in the layer as epsilon goes to zero, right? So that's just saying that we've chosen the, the delta scale properly. Um, but well, I mean, let's make that substitution now. Um, rewrite the differential equation in terms of this variable. So as should be pretty familiar by now, the y double prime term is going to become, we've seen this in earlier lectures, it will become, I mean, it was epsilon y double prime. In the new variables, it'll become epsilon over delta squared capital Y sub XX from the chain rule applied twice. And um, I mean, maybe I should look at all the terms. What, what were the terms here? I was trying to rewrite epsilon y double prime plus X y prime minus y equals zero. So what about the y prime term? Well, y prime is gonna be, um, remember how we do this. So by definition, it's dy by dx, but we think of that as d big y by d big x, and then d big x by d little x. And you can see that that's giving us this term is a one over delta, and this is a y sub x. So overall, this becomes, the, the differential equation becomes epsilon over delta squared 
y xx, capital X is here, the middle term becomes, okay, so little x has to be written as delta big X, and y prime we've just decided is one over delta y sub big X, and the minus y term is minus capital Y, and this is equal to zero. This is my inner ordinary differential equation in the new variables. And notice that the deltas are canceling out in the middle term. That's an interesting thing. So that is canceling with that. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Let's stare at that for a second. Epsilon over delta squared y x x plus y sub big X times big X minus y is zero. And the thing that's interesting is that if we just look at the prefactors, I mean, we're, we're assuming that with the correct scaling, y and all its derivatives will be order one. Um, actually, we don't even care about the scaling on y because this equation is linear. If I had any scaling on y, it would cancel out anyway, right? If they were all multiplied by the same scalar. So I don't really need to worry about that. Um, uh, actually, you know what? The, the truth is, this isn't really right, what I just wrote, order one. You can already see that from this picture. If you think of the inner region as being scaled like delta, like if these are, this is a typical length scale delta, since this is coming in linearly, a typical y scale is also going to be of the order of delta, right? I mean, like this whole thing sort of fits in a, in a cozy little rectangle is where all the action is. So I think you can see a priori just by knowing that those are lines coming in from the outside that um, actually I should say in here that I expect y and all its derivatives will be order delta. That will turn out to be true. But if you're bothered about this point, don't think about it too much because it doesn't matter what the scale is on these, it will cancel out. The important point is that if I just look at the prefactors in this equation, I have a one in front of this y, I have a one in front of those terms, and then I have this combination epsilon over delta squared in front of the y xx. And so now what's my balance? Actually, I see a question in the chat. Let me look at that. Um, in general, this would all rely on A of X being continuous, right? In order to have agreement on where the turning point is when we break the problem into two sub intervals. Yeah, we're thinking of the X as, I mean, we're thinking of the A of X as being continuous. Um, uh, Maria asks, what about y sub x? What order would that be? So that's what I'm saying. All these derivatives, I think. Uh, oh, I see. So your idea, Maria, is that, yeah, that's interesting. You're right. Hmm. Okay, I'm getting sloppy here. I, I should be careful. Maybe I'm going to erase this last remark that I made up here. This is, I don't think this is right. Let me get rid of that. Well, what I'm trying to say is I don't need to scale y at this point, because if I put in a scalar multiplying it, it would cancel out in the linear equation. I think we can see that the y sub x, I mean, back to your question, what is the order of magnitude of the derivative in the inner layer? I think it's gonna be order one because it's gotta somehow accommodate something that matches onto order one slopes. So, so even though y itself is order delta, like this, this typical scale is delta in both directions, the ratio of those two is gonna be order one. Yeah, it makes sense, good, I'm glad you agree. 
Yeah. And I think then if I take one more derivative, that's going to be order, the whole thing will then be one over delta. The second derivative will be one over delta. Exactly. That yes, I think so. Right. So, all right. Um, but here's, I, I'm belaboring this point. What I want to say is that all three of these terms in red should be the same order of magnitude. Because if this term is much smaller, if I ignore the first term, then um, I'm just dealing with the outer solution, right? Like if I cross out this whole thing, then I'm just looking at the outer solution again, and I've already done that. And these two are both manifestly of order one, so they have to both be there. So the only balance that makes any sense to get some new information is when these two terms balance each other as well as balancing this term. And so that uniquely determines the scale on which this term becomes important which is um, we get a three term dominant balance or the distinguished limit for this problem. If we don't just wanna get the outer solution again. So the distinguished limit is when epsilon over delta squared is order one. So that chooses our delta for us. Delta is gonna be order epsilon to the half. And actually, let's just set it to be equal to um, exactly epsilon to the half. So we won't worry about any constants in it. That's the right scaling for this problem. And it's interesting because last time we saw a square root of epsilon thickness boundary layer, we're seeing one here in this context of a corner. I mean, I haven't said this, I, maybe it's obvious. It is obvious, I'm sure that the reason it's called a corner layer is because these two straight lines are meeting at a corner or something that wants to become a corner as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. So let me make that choice, delta equals epsilon to the half. And then I, I'm left with an interesting little differential equation, which is um, the prefactors of all of them are now one. So I have y sub, XX, XX plus capital X, capital Y minus big Y equals zero. So that's my inner ODE. It's a very pretty looking equation. Oops, I forgot an X on it. There. Had I forgotten that earlier? No, I had it before. Okay, so that's pretty nice. Doesn't have any parameters in it. And now let's try to understand how the solutions of this behave. Um, so here's where I start telling my story a little bit. The, the first time I encountered this when I was teaching this course many years ago, I, I had never seen such an equation and didn't know how to solve it. And so I stuck pretty close to Bender and Orsog, which was the book you know, that we're using mainly. And so in section 9.6, they solve not only this problem, but also a much more general class of problems um, using a fairly exotic object, a special function called a parabolic cylinder function. So I stuck with that because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. and. Um, you know, so let's do it that way, because why not? I mean, you might as well learn a little about parabolic cylinder functions. They come up in, in this kind of setting and other settings. Um, so also Bender and Orsog say, while they're doing their general calculation, that um, for, for an equation very similar to the one I just wrote down, but a little more general, they say it's not solvable in terms of elementary functions. And so I sort of assumed that this easier problem that I'm doing was also not solvable in terms of elementary functions. And it turns out that's wrong. There are solutions of this in terms of elementary functions. I'll discuss that later. But let's for now just go back to my naive state when I'm hugging the shore and staying you know, close to Bender and Orsog's guidance. Um, so the solution of this, I mean, the general solution, right? This is a linear second order equation. Uh, 
it'll have two arbitrary constants. General solution of this can be written in terms of parabolic cylinder functions. Um, which I, I'm, are worth knowing about because they come up in other contexts in mathematical physics. They're related to um, quantum problems. Specifically, if you've had a, a good first course in quantum mechanics, you probably solved the quantum harmonic oscillator. And um, parabolic cylinder functions would arise in that setting. Uh, so if you deal with the quantum mechanical version of the harmonic oscillator, you'll also run into something called the, I mean, speaking American, the Hermite polynomials. I suppose in French, it should be Hermite. I'm not sure, right? Is that right? Hermite polynomials. But anyway, these, these objects, the parabolic cylinder functions do come up in other settings. So um, if you want to learn a little bit about them in Bender and Orsog, you can see a table of their properties on page 73. Uh, for the properties of these functions. Anyway, so um, at this point, I'm just going to do the tricks that are in Bender and Orsog and, and watch what happens. And then we'll come back and do things with actually truly elementary functions or closer to elementary. So, all right, so what's the solution of this parabolic cylinder equation that we're writing above? Um, First, you have to massage things to get it into the right form. So we're going to let y equal, this is not an obvious move at all, e to the minus x squared over 4 times another function that I'm going to call w of x. So why would you ever think of that? Jeez. Mm. That is not such an obvious move at all. Um, you'd have to think about why would you make that guess? Maybe we should return to that. Uh, I mean, I don't think that's obvious. It feels like that should be something you could see by skill in ordinary differential equations using ideas like reduction of order. Um, I'm not seeing it offhand, but, but if I do this move, Trust me that then you will, if you plug that in, you'll find that W, this term that's multiplied by the exponential term, will satisfy, I mean, this, this will satisfy the equation if W itself satisfies this equation. You plug the whole thing in, you'll end up getting W double prime plus negative three halves minus a quarter x squared all multiplying w equals zero. Looks wild. Um, there, so you'd have to do some algebra to check that. I mean, what's been accomplished here is what? We used to have the variable coefficient multiplying the damping term, multiplying the y x. What we've done with this move is we've shifted it over to a coefficient of y, or I mean, to a coefficient of this term, what we're calling w. And we got rid of the damping term. So in a way, we've cleaned it up. But the real point is that this equation is a known equation. That's a version of the parabolic cylinder equation. So this is in the jargon of special functions. Um, a parabolic cylinder equation with an index nu equals negative two, where this term here 
the negative three halves in the notation of the parabolic cylinder equation is nu plus a half. So I realize I'm not explaining too well, and that's because I don't understand too well. I, I've never worked with parabolic cylinder equations and don't know anything about them really. Like I say, this is just me aping the textbook. So I'm just gonna admit that. But anyway, this term in here in the notation of the parabolic cylinder equation is that constant term. So solving for nu, you can see that the nu is negative two. So according to Bender and Orsog, who do seem to know about parabolic cylinder equations, they say that then the solution is, the solution for this W equation is W of big X is some constant. So it's just a linear combination of the parabolic cylinder functions, D minus two, whatever the heck that is of X, plus another arbitrary constant B of D minus two of argument negative X. So this, I guess, comes out of the theory of this particular equation and you can read about it somewhere, probably in Bender and Orsog. But so let me keep marching along like this because this is sort of typical of how you can do perturbation theory if you don't know what you're doing. You know, you can sort of hug <laughs> to shore, stay close to what's known, follow Bender and Orsog, hope to reduce the problem to some known equation, and then look up the properties of that equation. I don't recommend this. It's not very good for understanding. And that's why what we're gonna do after we finish this part is just go in there with bare hands with the help of Mathematica, and we'll see that we can actually understand much more than this fancy technique. But this is more powerful, and, and this would work when our more elementary methods might fail. So I, I thought it was worth showing, even though I don't really understand it too well. Anyway, so I've got this W, um, where do things stand? I mean, let me circle this interesting object. Um, I've got that W that's gonna multiply this interesting ansatz for my solution Y. This is telling me what's happening, remember in the inner region where the corner is happening. I have to now determine the A and B by matching what's happening in the inner region onto those straight lines that live in the outer region. Okay, that's the part that's interesting. I mean, sort of, where we're gonna use some techniques that we developed earlier in the course. So let's find A and B. By matching, um, the inner solution to what we already calculated on the left side and on the right side. And remember that what's gonna happen when we go from the inner region out to where the overlap regions are, where we do the matching, that means we're taking the inner variable capital X out to infinity or all the way back out to negative infinity. And so, um, right, I mean, we've seen that in other problems with matching that in the inner region becomes effectively infinite in extent as epsilon goes to zero. So as we go to the overlap region, where the matching takes place, um, the variable, the inner variable little x is going to be going to both plus and minus infinity, you know, to match on either side. And so we need to understand the asymptotics uh, the asymptotic behavior of the parabolic cylinder functions at large x. of the D minus two um, as X goes to plus or minus infinity. And you know why I like this example is because we did stuff like this. If you can remember back in the old days, we did dominant balance calculations to understand large X behavior of solutions of differential equations without solving them. I don't know if you remember, we would guess e to the s, we'd plug it in there, we'd grind out a bunch of terms for s, 
So that kind of technology can come into play right here. That is, you don't have to know about parabolic cylinder functions to understand their asymptotics. You just have to know the earlier part of the course. So um, I'm gonna take it that we could figure that out. That is, we could study this equation up here, this one that I'm about to circle, this equation, I could figure out the asymptotic X dependence of solutions of this as X goes to plus or minus infinity by just doing my tricks that we did earlier in the course. So um, the book actually records what those asymptotic properties are and I'll just write them down. So if you look at Bender and Orsog, um, they, they claim that actually they solve it for all parabolic cylinder functions. So D sub nu for an arbitrary nu, index nu. They show that D sub nu of an argument they call T, um, that at large T, positive T, this behaves like T to the nu times E to the minus, T squared over four, this is as T goes to plus infinity. And they, they also claim that D nu of negative T behaves like, when I say behaves like, I mean, I'm not putting in the prefactor, just the T dependence, the leading order T dependence is one over T to the nu plus one, E to the, T squared over four. There's some normalization in how they define the parabolic cylinder function. So this is where the square root of two pi is coming from. Uh, I think from some integral representation of the whole thing. And then the gamma function of minus nu comes in. So this is all happening as T goes to positive infinity also. But remember, this is for an argument negative t. So this is the sort of negative infinity behavior of the, the parabolic cylinder function. And this is the positive infinity behavior up here. So um, we could derive these, as I keep saying, by um, earlier techniques in the course. That's one reason we did those things. We could derive all this by using integral representations of the parabolic cylinder functions or by using um, our earlier trick y equals e to the s, et cetera, as in the earlier parts of the course. And if you wanna see some derivations of these things, I mean, you don't trust yourself to do it. You could see page 96 to 98 in the book. where Bender and Orsog do some of this. So, so this is one reason that asymptotics belongs in a perturbation theory course, that you need asymptotic behavior of, of these inner functions in order to do the matching that comes up in perturbation theory. So let me pause there. I'm gonna have to write down some complicated expressions next. This might be a good time to take a breath. Want to ask anything at this stage, or am I? I'm, I feel like I'm kind of losing you, but uh, that's okay because this isn't the crucial way of doing things. You're okay, you well, okay, good. Anyone want to ask anything? Okay, so let me just keep going. It, it will it will get better. Um, so let's try to understand what's happening on the right side. Then we'll do the left side. So on the right side, that's x going to plus infinity. Think of it as we're in the layer, we're going out to the right. As x goes to plus infinity, if we write down our earlier expressions, we have y of x should be asymptotic to what? Well, remember we have this term, e to the minus x squared over four, and then this general w that we've been writing down here. So I'm gonna multiply by this prefactor, the, I mean this you know, x dependent prefactor and then times a general w. So here it goes, e to the minus x squared over four.
times a big expression, A. Now, I have to remember to substitute in these formulas here that I've just quoted from the book, whoops. These formulas, I wanna substitute nu equals two, right? Cause we're doing the pair of, or sorry, nu equals negative two, I think I mean, don't I? Wait, uh, yeah, nu equals negative two. Yes. So I'm doing parabolic cylinder function, special case, nu equals negative two, plugging that in, I get one over X squared here. Um, e to the minus X squared over four plus the B term will be X e to the positive x squared over four uh, square root of two pi over the gamma function of positive two. All right, so I'm just plugging in um, I'm trying to plug in like stare at this expression here. If I plug in nu equals negative two, down here, this will be a T to the negative one, but I'm not calling it T anymore. I'm calling it capital X. So that should bring up a capital X to the first power, which is what this is. And likewise in here, I have gamma of negative nu. So that's gamma of negative of negative two. So that's why this is a gamma of two and so on. So I'm just putting in the asymptotic behavior. Okay. And gamma of two, by the way, is um, one factorial, which is one. Right, because remember gamma of n plus one is n factorial. So anyway, there it is, that's our asymptotic behavior. And now let's think about this as X goes to infinity, what happens? There's a lot of nice cancellation. Let's stare at this. E to the minus X squared over four times itself. As X goes to infinity, that's really small, right? That's E to the negative monster term. And for, for extra help, we're also dividing by x squared. So this term is, is very small, exponentially small. However, this term has an e to the positive x squared over four, which cancels this term, okay? Which is cool because then we're just left with something that grows linearly in x, which is very nice because this is supposed to match onto a straight line that's growing linearly in x, okay? Very nice. In fact, so after you clean everything up, you get y of x is just asymptotic to b times capital X times the square root of two pi that's hanging around. Okay, that's looking good. That, that can match onto our straight line. This is all looking good as x goes to positive infinity. And then similarly, um, so maybe I'll skip the algebra because I think you see what I'm doing here. Um, y of x will be asymptotic to, it turns out negative a times square root of two pi x as x goes to negative infinity. You can just check those details. And so now we can see how to determine the A and the B. So the matching at this lowest order is, you know, we're just trying to match something which has a slope of two and something else which has a slope of one, negative one. So uh, what's that telling us? It looks like 
I need to have, ah, but let's be careful here. What are these variables? I'm using little x, whereas in the inner region, I'm using big X. So I don't want to forget a square root of epsilon, right? I mean, what is this in terms of big X? This would be, what, what was the rule? We had big X was X over square root of epsilon. So I could write this as two square root of epsilon big X. And over here, this is minus um, square root of epsilon big X. So those are supposed to match the expressions for big Y above. And so like looking at this one, I'm getting that minus square root of epsilon big X should match what I've just written here. Um, so minus a square root of two pi big X. And so those big X's are canceling out and it looks like I'm getting a is uniquely determined to be epsilon over two pi square root. And similarly, um, get that B comes out to be two times square root of epsilon over two pi. So we've figured out the constants A and B by this matching condition. And so putting everything together, we're getting that Y in the inner solution is square root of epsilon over two pi. Then that funny factor E to the minus X squared um, over four, which in the original variables would be X squared over four epsilon, right? This is my term, E to the minus X squared over four, but written in terms of the original variables, little x. And then times all that parabolic cylinder stuff, D minus two of X over square root of epsilon, that's capital X after all. And then plus we calculated a constant. B has this extra factor of two in front of it. So that gives me a two here. D minus two of a negative X over square root of epsilon, close the big bracket. So that's my inner solution. And then what about my outer solutions? Well. So Y out on the left, we said is negative X. I really should be saying is asymptotic to, let me not say equals. Well, or if I want, I could say plus the next order of epsilon. Maybe I'll just say asymptotic. And then this, oops. Asymptotic to negative X and Y out on the right is asymptotic to two X. Okay. So that's my summary of, of the analysis, the inner and the outer. Um, interesting thing, actually, you might notice at this point that observe the scale on capital Y, it's going like square root of epsilon. That's what I said should happen, right? Back when we were looking at this picture, way back here, I said, you can see that the scale on X and Y should be about the same because you're kind of coming in on a straight line. So whatever this X scale is, the Y scale should be similar. And so once we determined that the X scale was square root of epsilon, 
it's not surprising that the y scale is also. Anyway, the math shows that it, that that's right. So there it is. Um, you might want to write the whole thing as a composite solution. That's always very elegant. So let's just finish this part of the analysis by doing that. Um, why composite? the uniformly valid solution, we can still use our same prescription. Um, I mean, let's do it first for X greater than zero, since we have these two cases, right? I mean, so this case is the X greater than zero case. This is the X less than zero case over there. Um, for X greater than zero, we figure that we're getting yc is y in plus y out minus y match. Now, so the y in is that complicated expression, which I don't want to write down again. The y out is 2x. But well, what's y match? Well, I mean, think about what the matching was. The matching was that we just had to, well, this one's actually on the other side, but th this was the basic idea of the matching. We had to take a term like this and match it um, to the outer solution. And that, that was to, that's what determined this constant. But then once we have that match, the Y match is this object. It's a constant times X. So, so the matching object is in fact just minus two X. And what's cool is that those cancel out. And what you're finding is that the inner solution is actually the composite solution. I mean, it's kind of nifty. Y in itself can be extended all the way outside the inner region to give you the whole, I mean, I'm trying to say the inner solution is the uniformly valid solution. It doesn't just work on the inside. It also asymptotes correctly to what's happening in the outer region as well. So that's beautiful. I mean, that deserves a little exclamation point. And um, that's it. So, so this mess up here, this thing is the uniformly valid solution. As far as our, it's the first term in the asymptotic approximation of the answer. Okay, so I realize this is all kind of mystifying because we don't understand parabolic cylinder functions too well. So now I wanna to try to demystify it by the next level of understanding that I achieved maybe the second or third time I taught the course when I had the ingenious idea to ask Mathematica to help with this problem. Rather than just consulting Bender and Orsog, what would Mathematica do on this problem? And so that's how I wanna finish the lecture by showing you what it has to say. Um, do you wanna ask anything before we jump out of this part? We, we looked at Y out R when we were getting the composite solution, but did we not look at Y out left, the negative X and Well, that? oh, you mean over here? Yeah. So at the bottom, I, yeah, it, I would get the same thing. I mean, oh. if I do for X negative. Um, oh, sorry. I didn't see the top left part of it. Yeah, yeah. So for X less than zero, I'd have the same thing. I mean, it will be the same story. Be the only difference is that this would be a, a negative X minus a negative X. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other points to raise? Okay, so let me get... Um, out of this screen and show you what I did this morning in Mathematica. Uh, so let's share that. And I ought to be making royalties or something, some kind of, for all this advertising I'm doing for Mathematica. The, I think any other software would work fine too. You could use Maple if you prefer or Sage or whatever you like. It's just, I, I'm, uh, got used to using Mathematica. So anyway, um, where to begin? I don't know. I guess let's look at the inner solution. Let's talk about that some more. 
So I'll make this bigger still. 300, that's big. There. All right, so I asked Mathematica, please solve the inner equation using the desolve function. And it does, but it did not return any parabolic cylinder functions. It, it returned something um, in terms of an error function, you know, which arises when you're doing the indefinite integral under a Gaussian distribution, under the normal curve. And actually, if you clean it up a little and ask it to simplify what it wrote above there, this is what it writes. So let's stare at that for a second. It's saying that there's an exact solution, which is a constant times x. Now, hold on one second. We know that a constant times x works in the outer region. But let's go back and look at the differential equation. Suppose I plug in a constant times x. So y prime, if this is if y is cx, if y is cx, y prime will be c. So you'll get cx minus cx. And the second derivative will be zero because cx first derivative is c, and then the second derivative is derivative of a constant is zero. So in fact, cx exactly solves this for any c. even with that second derivative term included, that's kind of amusing. So once you know an exact solution of a linear equation, there's this trick called reduction of order, where you can take the exact solution x and multiply it by an unknown function, and then plug that in, and then you'll get a nice equation for that unknown function that you can solve too. So if you do all of that, that's Mathematica knows that trick, and it did that to get the c times x, and then using reduction of order, it gets something that we could show. I'm not gonna show these steps, but I, you can do it by hand. You can get something in terms of e to the minus x squared over two and an error function, which, which is just defined in terms of a certain integral that you, you would get by solving it. Um, I promise you it's not hard. You can do it by just doing what I said, learn about reduction of order and do it. So anyway, you get this very nice, relatively simple thing, much simpler than parabolic cylinder functions to my taste. So that's cool. You will find some books doing it this way. Like this is, I think in Mark Holmes' intro to perturbation methods, he does it this way. He doesn't use parabolic cylinder functions. Anyway, so now all that remains to be done is to determine these constants C1 and C2, which play the role of our A and B in the parabolic cylinder functions. So you can solve for them because we know that Whatever this is, these have to match up to something that has a slope of negative one on the left and positive two on the right. So in terms of the inner variable, big X, you know, being X over square root of epsilon, what I'm trying to say is what's the condition on the derivative that I want to match? I want to match that this has a derivative that goes to negative square root of epsilon as X goes to negative infinity. I'm just replacing the, the little x variable by the big x variable. So this is the condition I would need. And it has to go to two times square root of epsilon as x goes to plus infinity. And I'm, I'm doing this reasoning based on just thinking about epsilon going to zero. What I'm saying is when I speak about infinity as my boundary condition, I'm implicitly letting epsilon be arbitrarily close to zero. I'm not imposing the correct boundary conditions which would be this and this, y of negative one is one. Those, those conditions would involve a one over epsilon and things like that. I'm not using those, I'm just using slope conditions. So what I'm saying is this is only gonna give me the lowest order. Um, anyway, if I do this, which is a nice simple thing to do, I take the limit of this, the derivative of the inner as x goes to infinity, I get this very clean expression. Likewise, I could take the, and you know, that's supposed to be two square root of epsilon, we said. The limit in the other direction should be minus square root of epsilon. So doing that, I get this nice expression. I'm gonna solve for the constants given those two conditions I just mentioned. I get some very clean expressions for them. I substitute them in to my y inner, and then I get this stuff, which is all pretty attractive. 
So this is my inner solution, and we expect that will be the uniformly valid solution over the whole interval. So if I replace the x with the original variable, I get this thing. And now I can use this nice function in Mathematica. Well, actually, um, I'm going to call this the asymptotic solution. This is the asymptotics that you get by using the procedure we just described. But let me show you what it looks like as a function of epsilon using the manipulate command in Mathematica. So what this lets me do is vary epsilon smoothly and watch what happens. So I'll start with a whopping epsilon of one. And this is the behavior over the interval. Not much of a corner, but that's because my epsilon is so big. So let me start. I've started epsilon at one. Let me start reducing it. Watch this, All right? Eyes on the screen. Here we go, smaller epsilon. Okay, it's coming down towards the origin. It's getting kind of corner-ish. It's getting very corner-ish. Boink. That was an epsilon of 10 to the minus six at the end. You can see I can make a really nice little rounded corner there with this solution. It's beautiful. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very fun to move that thing around. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's it. That's the inner solution. Now, let me uh, just show you one other thing, which I didn't know until this morning, which was you can actually solve the problem fully exactly. So if I just ask Mathematica to solve this for the exact boundary conditions, it can do it. And it, re it produces this thing, which is um, even after you simplify it, I mean, it gives you some ERFs, but it looks a lot messier than what I had just written asymptotically. So this is the exact solution. This problem, you know, being a model problem, it's a little contrived. It does have an, an exact solution that we can write down with the help of Mathematica. I didn't know that before, but there it is. So I'll call that Y exact. And um, let's see how it behaves as I manipulate the epsilon. Well, uh, oh, I guess I haven't run the notebook. So let me do that. Hold on one second. Evaluate the notebook. Boom, boom, boom. All right, it's ready to run. And now let's try shrinking epsilon again. It looks like it's doing similar things to what the asymptotics did. And actually we can make a direct comparison. Um, oh, I found this amusing too. Can Mathematica do this course? Can it do an asymptotic expansion? I asked it to do asymptotic desolve on this problem. Do the first order. So epsilon, the lowest order in epsilon, it returns this interesting expression, one half x plus three square root of x squared, which reminds me of algebra one, because I used to simplify this to be x, but my teacher would take points off and say, no, it's absolute value of x, which it is. So Mathematica <laughs> knows that. And if you plot that, you get something that looks kind of absolute value-ish. That's the lowest order. Now, what if you go to the next order? Will it discover the thing that we did with our asymptotic analysis? What do you think? Well, I ask it to go to the next order. So there's a two. Go to the next order. It returns this. I simplify it. I manipulate it and watch what it looks like. It looks like a disaster. It looks totally wrong. I don't know what's going wrong, but the current version of Mathematica is producing numbers of order 50 here. Actually, they get bigger as I go down to smaller. It doesn't know how to do this problem. It's producing qualitatively wrong behavior with some kind of asymptote coming from both. I mean, right, this is clearly not right. It's trying, but it's doing something nasty in here. And then only at the end, it looks decent but um, it's qualitatively wrong. So you cannot necessarily trust the current version of Mathematica's asymptotics as far as I'm concerned. However, if you try the leading order solution that I just showed you a minute ago, remember this expression, um, and compare that 
to the exact result, then you get this picture. Here's exact in blue. Here's our formula in orange. And they look pretty good. I mean, there's some error, but it's a uniform error. All It's the same error all across. This is for a big epsilon of one. Now, as I vary epsilon, watch what happens. So manipulate it down. And you see that uniform error is shrinking nicely as epsilon gets smaller. You can barely see the difference between the curves. Now you really can't, at least I can't see much difference. And then as epsilon goes to zero, you know, they both show that nice corner, both the exact and the approximate. So that's what I've got for you today. That's our, our corner layer problem. Hope you found that interesting. Um, next time we'll talk about a different kind of interior layer. And um, it's also a problem from Mark Holmes' perturbation methods book, where uh, a previous generation of students in this class found some mistakes in the analysis in Mark Holmes' uh, book. And actually, I see a lot of other authors copying that same analysis, so they're guilty of the same mistakes. And uh, I hope we're doing it right. Anyway, I'm going to show you what my students and I figured out in the past, and I, I think you'll find it interesting. So that's next time, a nonlinear uh, problem with an interior layer. Okay, so see you then. <laughs>